So the title uh, is, as you had already heard, uh, 3D printing puzzles in wood. And I thought it would be fun to just make a 3D print uh, in uh, wood that has the title uh, of my presentation. It took uh, like an hour to print. So the, uh, the back panel is 3D printed oak and the uh, darker brown color is uh, 3D printed mahogany. And by the way, if you have any question, uh, just unmute yourself, ask the question. Uh, we can have uh, interaction uh, as you like. So d don't, don't hesitate, we have a lot of time today. Anyway, let's uh, move on. I will first uh, tell you a bit about uh, the machine and the material. I will uh, present uh, more than 30 uh, 3D printed puzzles uh, in wood. And uh, finally, we'll take uh, Jose's uh, uh, camera and I'll show you around in uh, Studio Oscar, of which uh, you see here uh, also a, uh, a photo of the entrance. So let's uh, first have a look at the machine and the material. So the, how I got to this printer was actually, it started as always with George Miller. You know, George has introduced me into 3D printing and he really insisted that I uh, should have a 3D printer. So he brought me one and he didn't bring it from Florida, but he took it all around the world, uh, uh, around uh, South America. He brought a, a he brought it to um, Antarctica and then from there ultimately he brought it uh, to my house. Well surprisingly it still worked a bit so uh, George and I we made some uh, test prints but the thing clogged all the time and it was failing the settings. So at that time uh, a Dutch guy uh, named uh, Robert Bakker contacted me He's the guy that you can see here uh, on the photo. I hope you can see my cursor. But anyway, um, he developed a 3D printer for schools. And he said, well, you should have my 3D printer because you will have uh, lots less trouble. So you see the photo uh, on the right. Um, it's a very compact and open uh, 3D printer. So the, um, you ha it has a build volume of 20 by 20 by 20 centimeter and um, but still it's uh, quite compact you see uh, the 20 by 20 centimeter the 20 centimeters also the width of the whole uh, machine so it was made for schools so it's compact and open so all the uh, uh, children can see how the printer works and what makes this thing special is that it has no calibration and leveling uh, for those of you who have a 3D printer, you know the burden that every time you lift or move the 3D printer or somebody bumps into it, you have to calibrate it again. You have to uh, level the, uh, uh, the, the build plate. Well, this one has been made uh, very rugged. Um, so the, uh, the, the vertical rods and the horizontal rods, I don't know how, that, these are sort of guide rails. But they're highly accurate and they are highly strong. There is no way that they will bend. And actually, uh, uh, Robert Bakker, he one time dropped the machine uh, onto the floor. And afterward, it was still um, printing fine. Uh, no, pro no problem. So it was really made uh, that rugged. And to demonstrate how rugged it is, uh, he made a demo video, which I'll show you uh, right now. So what you're seeing here is he mounted uh, the thing on his bicycle and he ran it off a dike. I hope you can see it. And he didn't do this only once, but then he went up again and he did it twice. And he did e even a third time. And even after three times running it off the dike, um, the thing was still uh, printing and the print didn't show anything uh, um, uh, any problem. So yeah, this is uh, uh, really impressive. So this is really demonstrating if you're looking for a rugged printer that can take uh, a lot of abuse, then uh, this is uh, probably what you're looking for. So uh, let's have a look at uh, the machine itself. One of the things is of course the, the, the business end that is the, the hot end. 
And uh, what is special about the hot end is you have the material that's going in cold and they have a fan and a heat break to keep the uh, material cold all the way till the hot end. So above here you have the heat break and the cooling system. The material comes in uh, cool, then it gets heated to uh, more than 200 degrees Celsius. And then here you have a fan with uh, a nozzle that uh, disperses the air that cools off the material uh, uh, immediately to the, that it's uh, solid again. So um, in that way uh, uh, you go from cold, hot, cold in like a fraction of a second. Uh, one of the other things that's uh, very nice of this machine is it uh, has a magnetic bed. So um, here you see the Marcus ball, uh, which I'll present to you later. It's uh, sticking to the bed and you can just peel it off, get the uh, get material uh, off and then put the magnet bed uh, back onto the machine. Everything is uh, calibrated and works again. So and here uh, on, uh, in this photo you see the spool of uh, wood um, and let's go to the material uh, here. So there are uh, the supplier that I have uh, has uh, at this moment a uh, supply of five types of uh, 3D printable wood. Uh, birch, mahogany, oak, green wood and black wood. So uh, here you see uh, all the uh, five colors and uh, what you see here is a, uh, a filament dryer. At one oc uh, occasion I had a problem with filament that was uh, uh, somehow it had absorbed some moist and you can hear that because when you're printing then you hear these little steam explosions in your hot end and that's usually not good for the print and also for the machine. So uh, I put it into the dryer. By the way you can also use it to make beef jerky but anyway uh, um, I dried it and it worked and uh, I'm using the 3D printed wood uh, at such a rate that uh, usually it doesn't get any time uh, to get moist. So um, Ilan already uh, said, well, how the hell can you print wood? And of course, this is not real wood. It is 80% uh, transparent PLA. And PLA is a biodegradable uh, plastic that's used a lot in 3D printers because it has a very low melting point. Uh, so you can print it at uh, 180 to 200 degrees Celsius. And uh, one of its disadvantages is that uh, um, when you have it uh, in uh, that valley, where temperatures go sometimes go over 50 degrees Celsius, uh, it can already get a bit uh, um, melty. Uh, I, I don't know, there is some temperature um, where, where it becomes a bit rubbery, uh, the material. Um, so uh, the, what you are also seeing is um, in this example, uh, this bowl, uh, we are using breakaway support. So this is a clever trick uh, developed uh, already quite a few years ago. You print the material um, together with the support. So it goes layer by layer. And then uh, once everything is ready, you use uh, all kinds of uh, tools to get the material out. And of course, when you have the, uh, the thick parts, they feel like wood, but actually the support material, since it's only a single layer, you can handle it like cardboard. Uh, maybe I'll uh, demonstrate it uh, later today, but you just uh, pull in uh, your tools and you peel it away. You can cut it with, uh, away with a knife or, well, and then uh, you have all this uh, debris uh, left over. But uh, ultimately the pieces uh, come out uh, very clean. And that's also something I uh, like about uh, the material. So, um, What's more about this material? Well, first of all, um, there is no clocking, no warping and no misprints. And this is very surprising because as uh, uh, George has learned the hard way, uh, it's very easy to make uh, misprints. And with PLA, if you do anything wrong, uh, if the material is slightly, uh, well, has some water in it or something else, uh, you get the clogging and you get the misprint. And so far, I can't recall I've ever had uh, misprints uh, with 3D printed wood and I've been using the material already for six months. So also, uh, there is no warping. So for the usual PLA material, if you uh, print a layer on top of a layer, 
then the bottom layer has already cooled down. And then the layer that comes on top, it shrinks a bit while it cools down and it wants to pull up the bottom layer. So when you're printing a square, then typically you get these pulled up corners and sometimes the printer even bumps into uh, these warps and then you get the misprint. However, this material, because of its flexibility, um, it doesn't work. So when you uh, print something that's a square, you get a flat square uh, and not something, uh, not something warped. I already mentioned the easy and clean uh, breakaway supports. Uh, you also see uh, from this piece that uh, there is uh, the so-called gyroid infill. This is a pattern that's a bit wavy in all directions and it makes it, uh, the pieces very strong, uh, but still light. Uh, so the, uh, the specific density of printed parts is much less than uh, real wood because there's so much air uh, in it. Um, what makes it also nice is it looks like wood. Well, um, sort of, uh, we, we will have a debate about that later. But anyway, it, uh, it feels like wood, it slides like wood. Uh, you can uh, cut it with a saw like wood, you can sand it uh, like wood, you can uh, stain it uh, like wood, you can, uh, um, all kind, you can do many of the things that you would be doing to finish uh, wood. And also when you smell the material, it smells a bit like uh, burnt wood. And as you can see from this uh, three print, you have a very smooth surface. So uh, you see this uh, piece uh, uh, where I've been making dovetails and the dovetails come out uh, clean. And once it comes out of the printer, you can immediately start assembling the puzzle. So it's really a magical uh, material. So let's go to puzzles. So now you will get, um, well, most of you have seen my YouTube videos, you will get the equivalent of more than 30 uh, short Oscar YouTube uh, videos in a row. So let's start with the first one that's called uh, cubic trisection. Uh, most of you have already uh, seen this puzzle at uh, IPPs. Uh, George has printed uh, many in uh, um, ABS plastic. So this one has been printed in birch, mahogany and blackwood and uh, well, it uh, screws, uh, the pieces uh, just screw together and form a cube. Uh, this is what the pieces look like. And I've uh, printed 10 of them uh, for Puzzle Master, which I will send off uh, probably by the end of this month. So uh, by the end of this month, if you go to the Puzzle Master website, uh, you can uh, buy this puzzle. And by the way, some of my other uh, wooden 3D print puzzles are already for sale uh, with Puzzle Master because my uh, first parcel uh, just uh, arrived uh, with them. Another uh, puzzle is Screwballs. The very first prototype of this one has also been uh, printed by uh, George Miller quite a while ago. And I thought, well, this is uh, a nice uh, one to make in 3D printed wood because, uh, well, uh, you have the four balls uh, and I have five types of wood, so the fifth uh, type of wood is the connecting rods. Also this one uh, will hopefully become available very soon with uh, Puzzle Master. Fornot is already available uh, with Puzzle Master. Uh, so most of you know a bit about knot theory. If you take a piece of rope, knot it into itself and connect the start to the end, then the simplest form that you can make is a loop. The second simplest form that you can make is a trefoil knot, and there's a right and a left-handed version of that. And the third uh, or fourth most compli uh, least complicated shape is what I call the four knot. So it's uh, a knot that has uh, um, not uh, three crossings like the trefoil knot, but four crossings. So what I did for this one is I cut the knot in five pieces of the same length. And um, instead of uh, making it uh, just a smooth cylinder, um, I made this ropey type of uh, look. Again, this was first uh, prototyped by uh, George in uh, beautiful, colorful ABS. And unfortunately, that very first prototype has uh, gotten lost uh, somewhere in uh, China. Recent Toys has looked into producing it, but ultimately decided uh, they couldn't uh, manage. So anyway, uh, it's uh, still for sale uh, 
at an acceptable price with uh, Puzzle Master. And what you see here is also the puzzle has some uh, little magnets that keep everything together. So the magnets uh, make sure that everything clicks together. And then you have these little uh, knobs and holes that uh, make sure that everything stays aligned. And for this one, I chose the material mahogany because of the rope-like uh, look. So here on the right, you see uh, when it's not solved, it's, uh, it really looks like some piece of rope. Archbur is a puzzle that was originally uh, produced by uh, bits and pieces in metal and it got out of print. But still people kept asking me, um, can I buy this uh, puzzle for, from you? So I decided uh, to print it in uh, wood, in this case, uh, um, birch. So I tried uh, three different colors of wood and uh, the birch wood uh, has the best uh, contrast. And the uh, disassembly is quite simple. You first pull out the first piece, the second and then the third piece. And then you have three pieces that, you, well, you need a bit of dexterity to, pu to put them together like that. And then you can assemble it again. It's not a really difficult uh, puzzle, but uh, it's a lot of fun uh, to solve. This is uh, the dovetail burr. I published this one uh, today on uh, YouTube. And this is just to show off my uh, woodworking skills. Because, well, what do you think uh, of my uh, dovetails? And they go to together really smoothly. And it's amazing. Uh, I just need to draw them. Uh, I press the print button and then I have a puzzle that uh, fits uh, together perfectly. And one of the things that you can see is uh, the grain of the 3D printing. When you look at this uh, birch piece, then you see the horizontal grain. And you see if, uh, if you can look at the details, you see little particles. So it uh, really has the spotted layered look of uh, birch, which is uh, amazing. And of course, at the bottom, uh, you see the, uh, the, the pattern of the 3D printer itself. And since the printer uh, prints its bottom layer at 45 degrees, you see all these uh, 45 degrees stripes at uh, the back end of the uh, puzzle. And Oscar. this one is uh, also already for sale uh, from Puzzle Master. Oscar, we have a question, just a second. Go ahead, um, please ask a question. Excuse me, this is Kathleen Malcolmson. I'd like to ask about the friction, the feel of the dovetails as you pull them apart. Um, oh, in that case, I should demonstrate. Uh, let, let me see whether, well, uh, let, let, let me uh, uh, do the demonstration uh, in the, the tour of Studio Oscar, but uh, um, I, I can tune it uh, as loose or tight as I want. So I can make it as lo so loose that it just falls out. But here I chose uh, a little tight. Uh, so um, when you pu push them through each other, uh, the dovetails stay in, they don't fall out, but it doesn't require any excessive force to get them out. Does this sort of answer your question? Yes, it answers it, that you, that you can tune it, fine tune it. Thank you very much. Yeah, and one of the things that I've learned uh, with this uh, material when I'm printing in nylon, if I want to have a loose fit, I need to have a uh, 0.2 millimeter gap uh, because the nylon is that accurate that this will be okay. Uh, for the three printed wood, I'm typically using a 0.3 millimeter gap if I want to have it loose. Of course, for the, these dovetails, I chose uh, 0 0.2 millimeters because I wanted to have it uh, a bit tighter. But yeah, it's uh, something that's uh, completely tunable. So going from the dovetail burr to the dovetail altar burr. Um, so instead of uh, six pieces that fit inside the cubic shape, you can get to seven uh, pieces. And this is a trick that I originally learned from uh, Naoki Takashima. When uh, he made my hyperboloid burr, I made it for six pieces. And then he sent me a photo like, hey, Oscar, I put it together with seven pieces. So, uh, well, this trick can also be applied to a regular burr. So dovetail alter burr is uh, effectively the same uh, puzzle as dovetail burr, but it has uh, seven pieces instead of uh, six. And yeah, it's... Uh, 
again, it's very, uh, it, it's not too difficult uh, to solve, but it's, uh, it's fun. Uh. One more, the dovetail cage. Um, so uh, having a lot of fun with these uh, dovetail uh, pieces and since it uh, takes such a short time to make a prototype, I think uh, um, the whole uh, cutting of the dovetail cage was m maybe uh, one hour of work. Um, I still had some discussions with George uh, whether we could make it uh, easier or simpler. Um, but uh, this was, uh, was a, um, a design that worked. So the way that you're, you solve it is actually uh, there is a bottom half and a top half and you pull them uh, the top from the bottom and then once you have pulled it in two halves then you can start disassembling each of these halves. And the reason I did that is because I didn't want to have one single piece that slides out uh, as a whole and just some extra trick. So I have a riddle for you. So you see the dovetail cage. It has 12 pieces. And if you look at the template of the pieces, it has one, two, three, four positions, and each of them can be male or female. So here we have male, male, female, female, uh, male, 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 female, uh, etc. So when you count, there is a total of 16 possible pieces. Since we need only 12 pieces, you would say, well, let's uh, have all pieces different. However, uh, there is always one duplicate. So in uh, my design, you see this uh, mahogany piece. There are actually two of them that are identical. And unfortunately, this is unavoidable. And this is uh, my riddle to you. Uh, start thinking about it. Why is it impossible <laughs> to, have to have all different pieces? Any takers? Mm. Give, anyway, us let's, uh, Give us time. Give us time. Anyway, let, 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 let me know your answer in the, in the chat uh, window if you have uh, a good answer. And then uh, we'll, we'll see how far we got. So another puzzle that I've uh, made is the dovetail Soma cube. And here you see that I've uh, used all uh, five different uh, types of wood. Um, Sorry, I got distracted by the chat. Uh, I wanted to see whether the answer was already there, but uh, unfortunately, uh, only uh, good guesses. So, uh, dovetail soma cube is a, a soma cube that uh, has dovetails, um, and you can see the five different uh, types of wood. This is the the green wood, and depending on your taste, uh, some people really like the green color. And some people looks like, uh, well, when you have eaten too much spinach and one day later, well, you understand. So some people don't like uh, the color. Personally, uh, I like the combination uh, of colors. Um, what's interesting about uh, the dovetail Soma Cube is originally I designed it as a put together puzzle because, uh, well, you need to put the pieces together. But when I gave it to my brother-in-law, I realized that it's also a take apart uh, puzzle because if you just try to pull out one piece or another, it won't work. And also if you just start pulling on one end or the other one, it won't work because the whole puzzle pulls in two. And only if you uh, take it at the right places, you can make the shift move to take it apart. And then you'll find out that it goes out uh, very smoothly. For this one, I took the 0 0.3 millimeter uh, gap so I wanted to have a very smooth movement. But the interesting thing is that uh, if you don't do the right movement, you can apply a lot of force and uh, nothing happens. <coughs> so uh, for this one, I have a design uh, challenge. And this is one I've been uh, really um, pondering over. I've uh, asked George Miller for help and uh, he had given it some thought and ultimately he gave up. So when you have a dovetail, uh, oh sorry, when you have a Soma cube, uh, all of you know by heart that the Soma cube has uh, 240 distinct solutions. And of course, if you take a solution and you connect two pieces with the dovetail connection, then those two pieces belong together 
and you get fewer solutions. And the more dovetails that you add, dovetail connections, so male plus female that you add, um, the fewer solutions. So for the uh, dovetail summer cube, I added uh, a total of uh, 11 uh, dovetail connections. And it's very easy to prove that it's a unique solution. Actually, when you have found two pieces that fit together uh, correctly, then uh, finding the correct place for the other pieces is uh, fairly simple. So what I'm uh, really uh, wondering, if I reduce the number of dovetail uh, connections, can we get to a sweet spot where there is only one solution that is the actual solution that can come apart, but there are multiple um, near miss solutions where everything could in theory fit together, but you can't take it apart. And maybe this is something uh, someone can design in uh, Bur tools or so. I have no clue uh, where to start because uh, if you just start randomly adding dovetail uh, connections, you get a combinatorial explosion and it will be so much work. So um, I think Andreas uh, is here. Uh, Andreas, if you know any way to get uh, this challenge into Bertels, I would be uh, very happy. Anyway, this is uh, my challenge to you. And by the way, I don't expect an answer by the end of uh, my talk. Here's uh, one more, um, also available from uh, Puzzle Master, uh, the dovetail uh, cube. So uh, what I've done here is taking some uh, cubies, uh, added some uh, dovetails and put them together. And actually I'm not the first one uh, doing this. Uh, several people have done this before. I've uh, made the first design some, sometime uh, in the 1980s. Uh, I think I made a cardboard prototype or so. But anyway, uh, um, it goes together. I uh, found a nice uh, color combination. And this one, uh, I'm not really happy about it because it has multiple solutions. And uh, there is one solution that has all the colors aligned. There's also a near miss solution that has all colors aligned, so that's nice. But there are also multiple other solutions. For the, so for this puzzle, I have the same challenge to you as uh, for the dovetail Soma cube. Uh, like, can you find uh, a design that has only one real solution, but many, many near misses that don't come apart, but fit together? So um, dovetails, as you know, you have uh, two types, male and female, and they form a connection. But there exist also hermaphroditic dovetails, where uh, each end has uh, a male and a female part, and they slide uh, together. So again, here is a sort of uh, semi-random uh, design that I've made uh, to put them uh, together. And also this one, it has uh, multiple solutions, including, so I think it has, well, what I found, I, I found three solutions of which one is a near miss. So uh, one of the three doesn't come apart. Yeah, but by the way, if you switch to my uh, 3D printer, um, you, can, uh, you can look at the screen, you see that uh, the 3D printer has just uh, stopped printing. I can hear that, but uh, most likely you didn't. Uh, you could, I'm not sure whether you could hear the printer on the background. So it's really a very quiet printer. Anyway, um, let's uh, proceed. Another uh, uh, try that I made was the fractal maze. So this is uh, again printed in birch wood and this is printer as a single layer. So uh, topologically, this is just uh, one uh, flat piece of uh, well cardboard that uh, sort of folded in these uh, shapes. And uh, the object is, well, you see the little ball, oh, too quick. Uh, you see the little ball uh, on the right. Uh, and the object is to move the ball to the maze and to somehow get it to the exit at the bottom right. And here, I'm not really sure whether 3D printed wood is the right material uh, for this because it's a single layer and it really has the sound, the feel of cardboard. So instead of uh, um, looking classy, looking high value, somehow it uh, looks and feels very cheap. Also because it's single layer, it's very light. So 
from a prototyping perspective, uh, this is a very successful prototype. Uh, the ball wor everything works. Uh, the ball stays in the maze except at the exit, etc., uh, etc. Et but still, I'm uh, not sure whether uh, this application of 3D printed uh, wood is a good application. Added maze. Uh, Robert Abbott, um, many of you may know his uh, name. He's uh, quite famous for his uh, maze designs. I've been uh, emailing him uh, quite a lot, uh, well, um, uh, about a decade ago. And unfortunately, Robert Abbott is no longer with us, but uh, some of his brilliant designs are still there. And uh, one that I really like is uh, Abbott's 3D maze. So uh, this one was uh, published uh, by the Karbatschuk uh, family in their book, Age of Puzzles. And uh, here you see the, the floor plan of the maze. You start in one corner and you go out in the di diagonally opposite uh, corner. And uh, what's brilliant about this maze is that you have a lot of loops and more loops and loops connecting to loops. And there's only one uh, inter, uh, place and that's all the way in the middle, you see this little gap here um, where the two loops connect. And it's so easy to miss because if you're here, you can easily roll over and go into that hole or go back and roll over there. So um, you really need to uh, find out. And uh, George Miller has uh, tested this maze and he really um, spent a lot of time to, uh, to get the ball out. So you see the steel ball here. And the way that is, uh, I developed uh, this maze is um, my, the, the ball is uh, 13 millimeter or 13.5 and the holes are 14 millimeter where they can go through and they're 12 millimeter where they can't go through. So um, the, the difference in diameter is so subtle that it's very hard to see with the naked eye. So you can really get uh, uh, confused and even finding the exit hole. So uh, in the uh, middle photo at the uh, bottom left, you see the exit hole. And if you look carefully, you see that it's slightly larger than its uh, neighbors. But if you don't look uh, carefully, you, you'll easily miss it. And so when you're rotating the puzzle in all directions, you can really uh, easily use uh, loose orientation. So and here are some more photos uh, showing that it's uh, completely hollow. And again, uh, uh, I've uh, 3D printed this uh, puzzle also in uh, PLA. And uh, so uh, pure PLA plastic. But the problem with the warping was that uh, at the inside, you have these uh, columns. And there is a, a support structure in the columns where the column is first vertical, then it fans out uh, 45 degrees. And uh, when I was using regular PLA, it warped all the time, uh, the material curled up and then uh, the 3D printer bumped into the curled up pieces. And then I had the misprint, either something broke off and then you get a whole spider web of uh, material or it uh, dislocates uh, the stepper motor and then you get your next layer that is uh, like uh, uh, a millimeter or half a millimeter dislocated from the layers below. So ultimately, I made this uh, uh, work in plastic by uh, tilting the, uh, the model a bit, but in 3D printed wood, it goes uh, correct uh, immediately. And again, this is what I like uh, about uh, the material. It just works, it wor doesn't warp, and it looks, li looks nice. I'd like to make a comment here on this particular puzzle, Abbott's 3D. And that is, when we first, uh, Oscar and I started making the puzzles we in 3D, we wanted to make them so puzzles that could not be done with injection molding machines. In other words, non-mass marketed. But uh, then they went to spin casting, Hanayama did. And finally now, uh, Oscar has produced a puzzle truly cannot be done mass marketed. This one has to be done with 3D printing. There's no way you can get all that inner structure uh, with with injection molding or spin casting. Thank you for that uh, comment, George. Yeah, this is something you're not going to make in spin casting. It really needs to be built in multiple layers. 
and of course uh, uh, that's uh, um, 3D Maze, the original version was made in uh, four or five layers that were just uh, stacked on top of each other. This is one uh, in one uh, print you make it or you have to glue several uh, layers together? So this one is printed in one print, so it just starts at the bottom layer and then it goes layer by layer all the way up. And what's interesting about uh, the uh, FDM 3D printing, that is if you go um, uh, up at the 45 degree degrees angle or more vertical, then you don't need any support material. So you can just um, build outward without uh, support material and that's a very powerful uh, option. Uh. Mm. So here's another uh, 3D printed maze. Um, it's the Boston subway maze. It's uh, something I originally made uh, uh, from laser cut acrylic. And then uh, George Miller together with Dave Rossetti, they decided to uh, turn it into an IPP exchange gift. Um, so several of you have that exchange gift. It's already uh, from many years ago. Um, and they put in a one-way uh, mechanism so you can go from home to work and then uh, quickly back to, uh, to home to reset the puzzle. So the way that the puzzle works is uh, you have uh, a set of horizontal channels on top and you have a set of vertical channels at the bottom. And if you look uh, carefully at the picture, you see that some holes are larger and some holes are smaller. And of course, the larger holes are the places where you connect the top and the bottom uh, mazes or the top and bottom uh, channels. Um, so the object of the puzzle is you start at the bottom right and at the bottom left you see a hole or well in this picture you can see the hole better. You get it out of the hole. And this uh, is again um, a puzzle that has a lot of uh, loops uh, where you can uh, um, lose uh, well lose your way get lost and uh, there is only one place where the loops uh, connect and to make it more difficult uh, that's on one of these paths where you have uh, two holes at the end and one hole in the middle and of course the hole in the middle is the one that you need so uh, um, you just uh, need to have dexterity if you just start moving it around uh, for sure you're going to miss that hole and some others uh, this maze was named uh, Boston Subway Maze because it was an exchange at uh, the Boston IPP. But more importantly, um, the Boston Subway is one of the oldest in the world. And it has the problem that not all uh, subway lines cross each other. So if you want to go from the red line to the, green li uh, to the blue line or vice versa, you need to uh, make one stop with the green line. And in Boston, they have this problem already for ages and they have considered uh, building a long tunnel or a pedestrian walkway or something like that. Uh, but uh, at this moment, uh, the last thing I read in Wikipedia is that uh, the problem uh, persists. And I'm not sure whether it was Dave or George uh, who came up with this uh, theme, but I really like the theme. It was so appropriate. And here you see the stack of uh, 10 of them that uh, I will ship to uh, Puzzle Master by the end of the month. Screw Barrel, yet another uh, uh, 3D print uh, made in wood. Um, this is a print that has uh, only three pieces and it's uh, inspired by the work of Scott Elliott. You know Scott has recently produced the heart with Hanayama, you already have the diamond, where you have to screw apart uh, two pieces and they can be highly confusing. So um, we thought, well, why not uh, uh, do three pieces? So uh, the way that uh, the puzzle works is I started with this rectangle and then you see one wavy form like this and another, well, sinusoidal form uh, like this. And uh, when you uh, imagine that you can move these three pieces up and down, then you see because of this bulge, the, those two pieces, the middle one and the right one, they always stay connected. So the only way to solve this is if you take this piece and you move it uh, down. So the next thing that I did was take uh, this shape and warp it um, 
by I don't know how many degrees. I think uh, um, more, uh, more than 50 degrees or so. And so then you get this pattern and you see there is one straight line and there is one, the bulging one and the one that's uh, the exit uh, one. But uh, because of the diagonals, it's already very hard to see. So it's actually, I think it's this one that you need to slide out uh, in that direction. But anyway, uh, when you have the barrel and you look at the sides, uh, it's almost impossible to see where it's uh, wider and narrower. So when you just start moving, it, uh, it gets stuck and only one piece uh, goes out. And this one I uh, uh, 3D printed with 0.0 millimeter gap because I just wanted to have it tight. And I used, uh, I was, uh, have been sanding this uh, surface. So this is why it looks so smooth. I've been sanding it to get all the layering out and to make it, uh, uh, well, slide over each other very smoothly. So when everything is together, it's together tightly. And once you get the piece moving, you can really turn it out uh, very easily. One of the things that you also see here is uh, a technique that uh, one can easily do with a 3D printer that is stop it and change materials. So this is an oak barrel. Of course, I uh, needed to 3D print oak. But of course, the, yeah, the metal rings around it, they are from uh, gray PLA material. So um, for, uh, for the three pieces, uh, first uh, a layer of oak, then uh, I programmed the machine to stop. Then I uh, loaded the other material uh, and the third material, fourth and fifth. And uh, th th there we have uh, this uh, very nice looking uh, result. So um, the bowl that you have uh, seen me uh, three printing is the Marcus bowl. I uh, printed this uh, several weeks ago uh, because, well, our Corona situation uh, doesn't allow me to do indoor sports. I usually play volleyball. My wife, Jose, she plays tennis. So I've joined her tennis club. And then Jose said, well, can't you make a puzzle that looks like a tennis ball? And then I thought, hey, Marcus Gutz had a very nice design that was a cube that was built a two by two by two cube that was built of, by, of uh, four one by one by two units where the opposite ones were connected. And this was really a riddle like how could this uh, exist? So I took uh, Marcus design, I um, turned it into a sphere. I uh, added, of course, the tennis ball seam. And uh, what you see here is also some uh, uh, tiny magnets. So once you have solved it, uh, it uh, clicks in place and it stays together. And also uh, this is both a put together and a take apart puzzle. So when you give this uh, puzzle to a lay person, for instance, one of your mates at the tennis club, they really are thinking, should I turn, push? And uh, it's not obvious uh, how to take it apart. Uh, of course, once you have the right feel, then uh, it's just two or three moves and you can uh, uh, slide them together. But uh, yeah, it was uh, a brilliant uh, design by Marcus and I have the uh, wooden version uh, from him, but uh, I'm really happy with this uh, tennis ball version as well. And uh, Puzzle Master has just ordered a batch, so that's the reason uh, why I'm uh, printing them. So hopefully uh, available uh, with Puzzle Master in one or two months or so. Have you nog een beetje water? Ja, kan maar. Sorry, uh, got a bit uh, dry throat. Thank you. I'm taken, uh, being taken well care of here. So uh, here's yet another puzzle. This is the Hanegraaf uh, paradox uh, by the late uh, Anton Hanegraaf. In uh, the 1990s, he showed me a puzzle with uh, 10 pieces that uh, together form uh, a rhombic Try a contrahedron. And the puzzle has, uh, um, well, some of you know this uh, Penrose geometry. You have the sharp pieces and you have uh, the non sharp uh, pieces. And if you uh, uh, glue uh, one onto the other, then you get a piece that is chiral, which means uh, it's different from its mirror image. So you have uh, um, six times uh, part A and four times part B. And one of the interesting 
things that uh, Anton found. If uh, you take three times A plus two times B, you can make a rhombic icosahedron. So rhombic tricontrahedron means 30 uh, faces. Rhombic icosahedron means 20 rhombic faces. So it's not a regular icosahedron, but a rhombic icosahedron. And when you take uh, three of A and uh, two of B, you can get, uh, well, actually two of these, uh, because uh, in total you have uh, 10 pieces, so five plus five. So that's very nice. And then in his uh, demonstration, he shows it to you. Then he dumps all the pieces uh, on the table again, and then he resembles it four times B, B plus one time A. And that's also a combination that fits together. And you're left with five times A. And the interesting thing is with five times A, you cannot assemble uh, the rhombic icosahedron. So this is a paradox. Uh, so he's playing this like a magic uh, trick, like, okay, I'm smart, I'm assembling these uh, pieces, I dump them, I help you, I assemble the first one, you do the second one, and then you feel stupid because you can't solve it. And of course, uh, the sleight of hand is uh, you need to take the pieces from the first one. Really a nice uh, puzzle. And again, I'm amazed about uh, the quality of the wood. So you see, the, see these uh, sharp edges. They are 36 degrees. Uh, um, so that's a very pointy angle. And they came out uh, completely clean and uh, sharp. And um, it's amazing. I think the uh, radius of curvature is like 0 0.4. Uh, 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 the diameter of curvature is 0 0.4 millimeter which is the uh, diameter of the nozzle of my 3D printer. So, um, one more puzzle. I uh, hope you're patient. Uh, we're, we're getting near the end, don't worry. So, another thing that I've uh, done with 3D printed wood is a combination box, which is a combination lock. And uh, what you see here is uh, there are uh, four rotors and there are some grooves in the rotors. And of course, only if you have the correct combination, uh, you can slide open the box and get the secret contents from it. And I used uh, screws uh, that uh, go into the grooves. And you see also uh, the mandatory fake grooves. So you can't feel the location of the grooves. So uh, if you just try to solve this by touch and feel, you won't find it. But still, this is not a gambling puzzle or, uh, um, or a, uh, a lock. It's a, a, a real mechanical puzzle because what I did is I mentioned you, to you the glow in the dark uh, material. I showed you the little light bulb and actually you can print uh, the glow in the dark uh, in layers. So I had the bottom layer uh, that is uh, completely white. So it's opaque. Then I added a few layers of this uh, glow in the dark material. And then I finished the whole part off with wood. And because of the white color, you can't, um, you can't, when there is light, you can't see the glow in the dark. So it's like it has a white uh, end. However, if you, uh, uh, the white lets light through. So if you uh, have it in the sun, you can, uh, or under a lamp, you can charge the glow in the dark material. And then when you go a dark place, uh, for instance, the closet or so, then you can uh, see the, uh, the secret code. And in this case, it is uh, 2051, which by the way, is uh, the home address of Brian Pletcher. Um, anyway, um, and when you do the secret code, then you get, uh, get it out. And the reason why I chose the uh, uh, address of Brian Pletcher as the secret code is I know that uh, he and his wife, they really like uh, escape rooms. So I have the feeling that this glow in the dark trick is something that could be used in an escape room that you have the secret code in a drawer and there is a flashlight and then you need to uh, charge, charge the glow in the dark with the flashlight and then you need to do uh, turn all the lights off to get the clue. So I think this uh, would make something great for an escape room and uh, uh, Brian is going to try and connect me to the escape room uh, scene and see whether we can implement this uh, somehow. Um, many of you know that I like twisty puzzles, so I had to try a twisty puzzle in uh, wood uh, too. 
Uh, this puzzle is called uh, dust cube 2. The dust part is because uh, it is a mechanism that implements uh, certain aspects of the boom dust puzzle. Uh, the cube part you understand. And the two is because it's a second version. Uh, I made the first uh, version that didn't work at all, so I needed to improve it. And the way that this uh, puzzle works, it's like a regular Rubik's cube with one thing special. That is, you see all the bigger cubies, they always need to stay together. So it's uh, possible to have them in a shape uh, like this V shape. You can have them uh, like uh, with a triangular symmetry where you uh, move this V one quarter uh, turn to the right and then you have the V vertical uh, part here and left and right or you can make a U shape but you can't get uh, the you can't separate these pieces. And this is a concept that was originally invented by Evgeny Grigoriev, uh, who put some uh, special uh, parts at the outside of a cube that bump into each other if you want to do the illegal move. Uh, however, I didn't like uh, Evgeny's mechanism because, first of all, you could see uh, the mechanism uh, too uh, clearly, but also it had overshoot, which means that the puzzle didn't align uh, well. Um, so what you're seeing here is uh, we have three special edges. So the edges that you see here on the right and at the bottom, uh, you have three of them and they have the special property that you see these um, flanges. They are different layers. So they are higher uh, at the end, middle and low. And they have the special property that they can be adjacent to each other. However, um, the regular edge piece is much bigger. So a regular edge piece cannot be adjacent to one of these. So if you want to turn, you can't uh, turn it past a regular edge piece, but you can turn a special edge piece along another special edge piece. Anyway, this is something you, uh, you need to try. And it's, uh, uh, well, it was a fun project. Uh, and here you see the puzzle uh, printed in uh, mahogany. Uh, I've also tried Blackwood. Uh, typically, uh, your 3D printed uh, uh, twisty puzzles are black. And um, it turned out well. Uh, the 3D printed wood really turns smoothly. It has uh, two slight disadvantages. First of all, the material is a bit less strong than the regular plastic or PLA. So this corner piece, uh, it's a bit fragile. I made it thicker, so it works. But if you use excessive force, you can break it off. So that's one disadvantage. Another disadvantage is that the sticker material doesn't stick too well to the uh, cube. So uh, maybe when I make this again, I will use some primer like nail polish to make it uh, uh, stick better. And of course, I always uh, use my heat gun to uh, make sure that the sticker fits uh, nicely into the, um, onto the face. Here on the right, you see how everything is printed. And uh, for this one, I just print all the pieces in uh, parallel. You see the little edge pieces are already uh, done. Uh, the corner pieces are still uh, work in progress. And one of the techniques that you're seeing here is uh, called raft. So this, uh, this, uh, this puzzle, uh, you see here some support material that has a little raft under it to keep everything in place. So that's one of the settings that you can use uh, for the 3D printing. So we're almost there. Uh, don't worry, almost. Uh, so here uh, we have the over and under puzzle, which is a twisty puzzle that uh, was inspired by um, a guy from the internet. I just forgot his name. Uh, he is uh, the make anything uh, guy. He made a very nice uh, puzzle like this with two of these uh, loops. And I thought, well, I add a third loop. So you understand the, the yellow balls form a loop, the, uh, the red ones and the green ones, and all the pieces, uh, parts look like this. So you have uh, two layers of uh, flyover. Uh, at the left, this is what it looks uh, uh, solved, scrambled. And I used magnets, both uh, for keeping it together um, as a uh, rotating axis, and the little magnets, they, uh, uh, align or register everything so that it, uh, it clicks. And here, uh, the 3D printed wood works well. 
So uh, the puzzle is functional, but when we're talking about looks, then you, I really think that um, using uh, PLA plastic looks better uh, on this puzzle than uh, the wood. So not sure that wood is the good uh, material for this uh, puzzle. And by the way, this puzzle is uh, very easy to solve. You just uh, fill, first fill the green channel and then you fill the, uh, the red channel. And then of course the remaining balls are in the yellow channel. So for, for, from a uh, solving perspective, uh, it's easy. So uh, I made a harder version um, that one can no longer uh, easily solve. It's called uh, Spaghetti Junction. And well, uh, probably all of you know uh, the location of this junction. It's somewhere in uh, the, the USA where uh, hundreds of roads are coming together over and under each other. So I uh, reused this concept. And here you have a total of four roads going over and under each other in different ways. So the two sides, they are different from each other. Uh, so uh, depending on how you uh, uh, click it, it has a total of eight positions. In some positions, you have a loop where uh, these, these are two, two units apart, where you can have a simple loop. But uh, there are also situations where when you make uh, move one marble, then all the marbles uh, uh, roll together. So that's, uh, um, again, this works uh, quite well in uh, wood, the same uh, magnetic tricks. And again, I think that uh, in this case, uh, the gray plastic looks a bit more beautiful, more nice than uh, the wood. But at least it works in wood. So, other than uh, making puzzles, you can also use it uh, to uh, make art. So I call this uh, Yosegi. You know the Japanese uh, art Josegi. Well, um, I took a photo of my wife, uh, Yose, and then uh, used some uh, material. And then uh, you instruct the 3D printer. Uh, well, you first load it with the uh, mahogany material, and then it uh, prints the mahogany parts, just a single layer. You swip, swap the material for black, and then you swap it uh, for the uh, birch. And then the birch one, you make uh, multiple layers and uh, turn it uh, into something that's like a plank. So it's a single layer, 0 0.35 uh, millimeter of uh, the actual picture, and the rest is just uh, filling. And well, I don't know whether you uh, recognize Jose uh, from this, but I made this very little uh, version uh, um, and when you look from a distance, uh, at least I recognize her. So um, one of my uh, colleagues uh, had her 60, 36th birthday uh, a couple of weeks ago, and she is coming to visit me. So I thought, well, what am I giving her for her 36th birthday? So I did the same uh, Yosegi uh, trick um, with her photo. And uh, well, here you see uh, the original photo, which I took uh, from Facebook and then uh, used uh, well the uh, all kinds of uh, software tricks to get it into uh, three colors. Uh, on the top right, you see the computer aided uh, design uh, model. And here you see uh, the result from the side. So it's a plank, it's uh, I made it a meter thick and actually it's uh, mostly hollow. It's uh, uh, mostly air, the gyroid structure again, and it has uh, support at the back end. So tomorrow we'll see uh, uh, whether she likes it. So um, we are at the end of uh, the puzzle presentation. It's time for Studio Oscar, but perhaps uh, there are some questions. I saw the chat window pop up several times. I didn't have the opportunity to read. So any questions at this stage? Oh, do we still need to share the screen? Um, uh, well, at, once I start walking around, uh, I will show the video, but uh, yeah, I'll stop uh, the screen share. Oh, by the way, um, what you're seeing on, uh, uh, on the screen right now, uh, this is an experiment with uh, uh, brown PLA material. And one of the things, uh, this was when we had a heat wave. So I put this uh, part uh, of the fake chocolate bar in boiling water and then uh, being very careful because then it starts to become rubbery. Then you uh, bend it and then you uh, uh, have cold water pour over it and it looks like uh, melted uh, chocolate. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's uh, uh, one of the tricks. 
Um, in the middle, you see uh, uh, my preparing of the presentation. This was the slide that you have uh, just seen. And this is the desk from uh, where I'm uh, presenting. You see the Marcus ball here. You see the glow in the button, dark uh, uh, light bulbs uh, and several other things. Here you see the entrance of Studio Oscar, some of my materials, the view. Uh, we have a house with a view, so that's great. And my photo studio. Anyway, I'll stop uh, sharing and it's time for questions and then we have a little tour through Studio Oscar. Let's uh, switch to the video of uh, Jose because I'm uh, going to uh, load the 3D printer. So, okay. Uh, so um, what, what you're seeing here is the 3D printer. Uh, you saw that uh, we have just finished the print. So one of the things that we do is we uh, take it off. And as you can see it uh, here, we have the three printed parts and it's really easy to, uh, to peel them off. And of course this, uh, this bit uh, you can uh, peel off uh, easily. Oh yeah, there we are. You can peel it off easily. So, um, but I'm going to do the peeling a bit later. First, I want to start uh, the machine with a new uh, print job. And I'm not sure, probably you don't hear it, but it's already hissing because I've uh, just uh, started the preheating. Um, it, uh, the, its first layer needs to be uh, uh, 220 degrees Celsius. So let me uh, first take out uh, one uh, card and add another one because now I'm going to print uh, something different. So I'm uh, entering it. Uh, at this moment, uh, the temperature setting is, uh, let's see, uh, we are at uh, 160 degrees Celsius, so a bit more uh, waiting till it gets warmer. So the next uh, thing that I'm going to make, I'm uh, going to use uh, the infamous uh, green wood. And uh, what I'm going to build is a next prototype of uh, this uh, funny shape. Um, so I prototyped this uh, uh, this afternoon and it's something that folds inside out and it should fold all the way through. But there's something wrong because here it sticks and it can't go through. So I have made a new design that uh, has the dimensions slightly different and then hopefully we can turn it uh, all the way through. And I thought, well, uh, let's uh, use the material, the, the, uh, the green material. And meanwhile, um, we are at uh, the, the right temperature. So uh, let me um, swap the spools. Uh, Jose, can you take this one? Yeah. So I'm, oops, getting, gewoon mijn filmen. So I'm getting the material uh, out here. So this is uh, the oak uh, material. Here we have this uh, spool of oak. We take the spool of uh, green wood. And whenever the material comes out of the machine, because the, uh, the hot end has been melted, uh, you always need to cut off a little bit, uh, just to make sure that uh, everything uh, is nice and clean again. So I'm feeding it uh, through the tube, which is a special material that has very low friction uh, to slide it through. I'm entering it into the hole. This is a bit hard to see, but uh, okay, it has been uh, entered now. And the next step uh, is to uh, start extruding a bit of uh, material. So I select the setting uh, extrude. And so it's now uh, purging the oak material and you see the color, well, I'm not sure whether you can see it, but uh, it's mm -hmm. now uh, yeah. changing to uh, green. Yeah, that's enough. So uh, now it uh, has loaded the green uh, wood. The wood is still dripping out a bit, but it's not a problem. And then I start uh, uh, the print. And this is the correct print. It's 43 uh, minutes. I say confirm. And then, okay. It first uh, calibrates its uh, X and Y and Z axes. And uh, once it has done that, uh, it starts printing. 
I hope you can all see it well. And not, not, not mic sound. So uh, as I already mentioned, this is a very silent machine. Many printers, they have a box around the machine and actually the box uh, takes on uh, vibrations and it's uh, like a guitar. So um, the, uh, Robert Wacker, he has analyzed the audio issue and he has discovered that having not a box around it, it's much better for the, for the sound. So what the printer does is first, it uh, extrudes a bit of the material uh, just to uh, make sure that uh, the material has purged well and then it starts uh, layer by layer. Anyway, let's, uh, let's machine uh, uh, start running and let's see what else uh, there is to see. Well, um, here is uh, my desk. Um, this is the picture that I uh, showed you last. Um, this is the, these are the little light bulbs I've been making for my brother-in-law. He's an uh, electrician. So, uh, and his logo is actually a light bulb. Uh, so I made this uh, logo thing for him uh, and uh, yeah, a batch of uh, 50 of them. Of course, also some fun ones where the glow in the dark uh, and we have a dark uh, bulb and one that's uh, transparent. And for the transparent one, it's impossible to see uh, on the camera, but uh, it's actually a puzzle. Uh, when you put a little ball in, into the hole, then it uh, ends in the bulb. But uh, um, inside uh, the bulb, there is a little cylinder that's sticking out. So when the ball drops, it falls next to the cylinder and it doesn't come out. And you really need to have, do some dexterity to get the ball out. And of course, when you hold it like this, um, there is a conic shape at the bottom, so uh, the ball really centers quite well in the middle. And if you're fast and you hold it like this and you move it exactly vertically down, then the ball should pop out. Oh, by the way, uh, spoiler alert. Okay, I was a bit late with that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, more work in uh, progress. First of all, the 3D printed wood, um, it comes out really flat. That's something you can see here. And one of the things I've been trying is to make a maze that is excessively difficult. It's impossible to see on the camera, but here you see a one millimeter ball and you see the whole pattern in uh, wood. And unfortunately, the wood material is uh, too grainy and sometimes the ball gets stuck where it shouldn't get stuck and sometimes it jumps over walls. So this is uh, still, a, uh, still a failed uh, prototype. But uh, work in progress. Oh, something to sh show to uh, Scott Elliott. Uh, thank you for the um, design of your uh, puck up. And here you see that I'm using the two materials uh, together. And this is an ideal uh, puzzle when you have leftover material uh, from the 3D printer uh, to 3D print things. So, uh, some, sometimes I have a few gram of material left over and well, what are you going to do with it? Well, I'm making uh, puck ups. <laughs> um, what do we, we have more? We have a scale. Um, before I start uh, the 3D printer, I make sure that I have enough uh, material. So um, I take an empty spool and then I take the full spool, I measure the difference and I know how much material I still have left. And the computer software tells me uh, how much material I need. So I know um, that I, for sure that I'm not going to run out of material. So let's see uh, some more of uh, Steady Oscar. Of course, I have uh, um, a puzzle collection. It's quite modest uh, compared to the puzzle collection of uh, most of you. So, uh, but these are some of my uh, treasures. So what you see uh, over here, I hope you can still hear me. If there's a problem, just let me know. And um, what you see here is my uh, supply of uh, materials. So uh, looking down, uh, you see a whole su uh, supply of uh, uh, different uh, filaments. Uh, here we have, uh, this is gray filament. Um, but, well, we have brown, transparent, uh, and I'm still uh, uh, working on the packaging. 
I bought some of these uh, vacuum uh, packaging things to, uh, um, well, hopefully that uh, when it's in a vacuum, there's less uh, uh, humidity getting into the machine, uh, into the filament. Oh, uh, this is uh, the three printer that uh, George Miller gave me. I'm uh, still keeping it uh, for historic uh, reasons. Um, I, let's, uh, let's see, I have a heat gun in, in here. Um, sometimes uh, there is a bit of stringing in uh, the 3D prints, that is that thin uh, wires of print uh, are there. And when you use the heat gun, uh, it just uh, melts away uh, during nights. Here you see uh, my uh, spools. I have uh, kept them until now just to show you that I've already uh, printed uh, several uh, kilo of uh, material. And what you see here at the bottom is uh, several more kilos of the material in uh, all types of uh, uh, wood and PLA. And here are some of the puzzles that I've uh, just presented you. I still need to figure out uh, how to uh, um, display them all. Then here at uh, the very end, uh, you have my uh, print drying machine. I'm going to make some uh, yellow Andreas base uh, for Puzzle Master. Uh, I make those in uh, yellow. Last time I had some problems with the material, so I'm uh, drying it. Uh, so this is uh, warm. It's uh, 45 degrees Celsius. Not warm enough to melt uh, the material, but warm enough to uh, get it uh, uh, get the moist out, and there's a little ventilator under it that uh, recycles uh, or recirculates the air or gets the air through. Then um, I have my own uh, photo studio, and now suddenly everything uh, gets uh, very bright. Uh, there is light coming from above. That's uh, that's here. There's light coming from uh, below. It's so hard to see, and I also have uh, this. Uh, uh, daylight uh, lamp for even more light. So a lot of light, and of course uh, uh, I can tune the amount of light so a bit more, a bit less, uh, or even out of uh, if needed. It is very nice to uh, have my own uh, photo studio. So, and of course I can't show you the view uh, because it's uh, dark here in the Netherlands, but you saw the photo of it. Anyway, let's uh, get back uh, together. Uh, it looks like uh, everything is going fine uh, with the 3D printer. It's uh, printing some uh, little pieces. Yeah. Anyway, um, that's it uh, from my side. Uh, for now, um, what else shall we do? Oh, we, uh, we let people ask questions and also start to look for uh, well, where to take the money to buy all the new puzzles that you have. Ah, you see our cats. <laughs> they are not allowed into the puzzle room. And they are not made of wood. <laughs> oh, this is T-shirt. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay, do we have any questions, guys? Oscar, I have a question. Can you put the uh, one of the balls, the ball you just printed off, could you uh, take the material away from that? Show us how that's done. Oh, sure. So let me just uh, show you uh, how taking away the material uh, works. So this is the ball that I just uh, took off the plate. You saw that, and it's very simple. You t just take the pliers, you push them in, and you get material out. And uh, let's, uh, let's take out some uh, more material. And it feel, feels like wood, that's what you're saying. Well, this part is more like uh, cardboard, so you see it's, uh, it's very thin. Yeah. So th this uh, feels and sounds uh, more like uh, cardboard, but uh, um, the, 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 the hard parts, uh, they uh, really look and feel uh, like wood. So um, 
Well, George, uh, I, I assume you have done this uh, type of work uh, already uh, many times, but for the 3D printed wood, uh, since the material it's so uh, well, it's so easy to uh, to peel and take out. For the magnets, are they press fit or do you glue them in? Um, I press fit uh, the magnets. I could uh, could glue them in, but it's not uh, needed. Uh, let me see. Um, Oh, and George, I have uh, used uh, your green-red uh, trick. So um, in one bowl goes, uh, go all the uh, green magnets and the other bowl only the red ones. And then of course you are sure that you got them all right. So that's, that's a great trick. Uh, thank you for teaching me that. As we have to say thank you very much for Oscar. Um, I think it's a good time to unmute yourself and say thank you by yourself if you want. Thanks, Oscar. Uh, it was great. Thank you, Oscar. Thank Thanks, you. Oscar. Thank you very much. Thank you, it was awesome. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you.